this little light of mine i'm gonna let it shine this little light of mine i'm gonna let it oh uh welcome back to another episode of black magic craft today i'm gonna show you how i make these cool lanterns on these wooden posts. It's a great intermediary project for people that have recently started in the craft and are looking to try out uh, their new skills at a little bit more detailed work. And I'm sure for some of you veterans, you will find some interesting new techniques along the way. A couple things to point out about this episode. This is gonna be a long format tutorial. I am going to show you every step in detail. So for those of you who are a little bit newer, I'm not gonna be glossing over steps here, assuming that you know them. Also, I very intentionally avoided using some of the uh, more expensive tools like the hot wire table on this, and I've refined the build down to just using simple tools like a utility knife. If you're new and unsure of what you need to buy, go check out blackmagiccraft.ca. It's my new website. There's also a web store on there that I just launched. I've set it up through the Amazon affiliate program and I list all of the tools and supplies that I use most frequently and why I use them and why I like them. So it's all in one place and you can make sure that you're buying the correct thing. Also, every purchase that's made through that store, Black Magic Craft gets a small commission from Amazon, but hey, little bit of money back into our community instead of Amazon's pockets, everybody wins. So grab yourself a drink, sit down, get comfy, and let's build a lantern. So to make this little lamppost, I'm just gonna be using a scrap piece of extruded polystyrene or insulation foam, also known as XPS. I get a lot of questions about this material and it is on my short list of things to cover on the basic series, but until I have that done, I will say here that the stuff you're looking for, you buy it at Home Depot or a similar store. Owen Cornings is the brand that makes the pink stuff and the actual product is called Fomular. Some other companies like Dow make it in a different color in green or blue and that's sold at stores like Lowe's or Rona. But what you are looking for is insulation foam in a big box hardware store in the insulation aisle. So hopefully that's enough for you guys to go on. Here, just grabbed a piece of scrap material. And to make the timbers for this post, we need to cut some uh, about, you know, quarter inch by quarter inch uh, stock. And I would normally do this on my hot wire table, but I know that's something that not many of you have access to. So I'm gonna show you that you can do this just with a utility knife and a ruler. I'm just eyeballing this, taking a straight edge, uh, and I'm gonna use my utility knife with a fully extended sharp blade. The trick is to use sharp, good quality, stiff blades. Don't use those floppy little dollar store ones until they are so dull that they just tear the foam. And I know a lot of you have trouble getting clean cuts, so I'm gonna show you how you do it. Metal straight edge and shallow pass you see, I'm only cutting it into the foam uh, about a quarter of the way through, now to about the halfway point, and then finally all the way through. And then you get a really nice cut here. I dragged a little bit, but see, you can do it with just a knife. Now I want to square up this timber, hold it securely, and again, shallow pass. And now I have my timber. So the next thing I wanna do is kind of chamfer these edges so that they aren't so, so square. I want it look, to look more like rough hewn timber. So I'm gonna take a nail file and I'm just gonna kinda of sand down the edges of this foam. And I'm not trying to do it evenly. I'm actually trying to do it rather unevenly get it deeper and wider in other points, make some, some gouges. This will all just add to the look of some timber that was carved with rough, rough hand tools. We first need the upright post. 
And this is something that I would not normally measure, but just so you guys can follow along and end up with one that is the same, I am going to pick an actual measurement, which will be two inches and I'll just slice it. And then I want a top piece. It's gonna sit on top here and I think a nice size is, uh, let's say, again, I would normally eyeball this, but just so you guys can make the exact same one, we're gonna go inch and a quarter. I am going to want this piece to have a diagonal cross piece. So first thing I'm gonna do is cut a just freehand 45 degree angle. It doesn't have to be exact. And I want it to cross both these pieces and I'm just kind of, again, eyeballing it. It doesn't have to be too accurate. So this piece from, from long to point to long point of the angle is seven eighths of an inch, but it's not that important that it's exact. When I look at this, I actually see that one of my angles is off. So I'm just going to cut it down so that it meets the corresponding piece much nicer. And we are left with our little wood frame. Because this is styrofoam and styrofoam this thin is not very strong, what I'm gonna do is take some toothpicks. And these are the ones that are round and pointed on both ends. And the trick to this project is to actually reinforce the styrofoam with these toothpicks. So what you wanna do is go right in the middle and you wanna feed this toothpick all the way up through here. And this is a little bit tricky because one, you have to keep it straight. You don't want it poking out the other, out the side. So you have to sometimes back it off if you feel that it's starting to go crooked and recenter it and keep going. You wanna go slow and you wanna kinda of spin the toothpick and or the piece as you go. And if you feel that it's starting to get close to the edge, again, just back it out and keep working it until you get to the end. It definitely does get difficult because there's you know, a lot of compressed foam by the time you get to the end of this. There, you can see it's starting to poke through and I actually see that it's coming out a little bit too close to the corner. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull this out and from the center, I'm gonna refeed from the top so that it hopefully finds the original hole and kind of meets in the middle so that I can come out here because I want this toothpick to actually protrude out the top to act as a uh, fastener for the top piece. Now we have this poking all the way through. I'm gonna leave it so that this peak isn't poking out any more than the thickness of the next piece of styrofoam. So about like that. And now we need to add some wood grain to this. So you can use a wire brush to add wood grain. You just have to be gentle so as to not tear the material too much. These wire brushes, again, you can find at a store like Home Depot, uh, usually near the stuff they sell for stripping paint. Or you can use an old barbecue brush or whatever, but they work really good for adding wood grain to styrofoam. And because these pieces are so small, it's a little bit better to do this wood grain on separately before you assemble the whole thing so that you can just do a continuous pass with, with the wire brush. Make sure you get all four sides of every piece. It'll be impossible to do it later. I actually also want to feed another toothpick through this top membrane or this top piece of timber here. So same thing. This one, you're gonna wanna cut off the excess. So just take a pair of snippers and cut off the excess and then 
pull it back and then so pull it back so that it's recessed a bit and then cut off the excess again and then take another toothpick and push it back into the hole there and now you have a very rigid piece of styrofoam with no toothpicks protruding so now we want to attach these two pieces together and the way i'm going to do that is with some uh, aline's tacky glue this is basically just a pva glue uh, that is a lot more viscous and a bit stronger than regular pva basically there's less water in it uh, so just take your piece and I like to dry fit them first before there's glue on it, just to see how it's sitting. Use that toothpick that's protruding and poke through. So now just dab of this glue on there. And it's, I like to take some glue and put it on the toothpick so that it actually, it actually bonds inside the hole there. And then just put it together pull it tight, wipe off any excess that's squeezing through. Now for this little cross piece, again, dry fit it to make sure it's sitting nicely. Sometimes it'll work better one way than the other. This piece, you're not gonna put a toothpick in just because it's a little bit too small and at the angle it's difficult to do. So what you wanna do is put a little dab of glue on each end piece, hold it in place, then take some little push pins, little sewing pins, and just use those to hold it while the glue dries. And don't worry about the little hole it leaves because it just makes it look like a nail hole in the end. You might find that you need several pins so that you can pin it from different angles to keep it tight. And it doesn't have to be completely tight. There can be some gaps. You still have this little toothpick poking through, so you can actually use that as a way to hold this in place stand it up as the glue dries. As this is drying, we can start working on the base. For this, we need some kind of a base that's large enough uh, that it stays balanced when it has the lantern hanging on it and also has enough weight on it to stop it from tipping over. So I want to embed a washer into the base. I think the best way to do it on this is to make a little brickwork uh, base but one that can hide this washer. So just this is just gonna be freehand. Take whatever washer you have. This is a one inch washer and cut out a square of styrofoam that's a bit bigger than the washer. I'm not even measuring this or making sure that it's square because I honestly don't think that it matters. So we need to find a way to embed this. So we're gonna take the washer and trace out a circle, circle traced out. And then what we're gonna do is I'm actually going to cut this a little bit thinner in a few different uh, passes. One, I think this base is way, way too big. I, I don't want it to be that beefy. I want it to be about two thirds that thick, just because I think visually anything thicker than that is going to look a little ridiculous. Now I'm actually going to split this down the middle at the line where the grout would be between the two layers of bricks. This is a little bit tricky. You have to really try to make sure that you're keeping your blade straight on both sides of the piece as you cut, or at least, you know, straight enough. All right, so now I have two layers here. Now I can cut out this circle and I'm just using a smaller X-Acto knife instead of the utility knife, basically using a up and down sawing motion to get a relatively clean cut. Usually you're not gonna make it through all the way in the first pass and you have to go a second time around. Pop that piece out and save it for later. We're gonna drop this washer into this cutout and just put in some hot glue around the edge to hold it in place. And I'm actually gonna put some on the washer and put back in the piece that we cut out 
because I want to make this, this is going to be the bottom, right? So I want this to stay uh, solid. Just let that tack up. And then again, because this is the bottom, now the little bit of styrofoam here is sticking up past the underside because of the thickness of the washer. I'm just gonna take my utility knife, go across and flush cut it. We are left with a reasonably flat base for this to sit on. And we can put back on our second layer here. First, what I would like to do, when we put the actual timber onto here, I would like it to be recessed a little bit. So I'm gonna take a scrap cut off from the piece we used to make this, and I'm going to trace out the size of this timber. And just like the circle, we're gonna cut this out. I'm gonna take our piece just to make sure it fits. It's actually too big. I would like that to be tighter, but such is life. Because we have this split into two different levels, uh, I can take advantage of that just like I did with the pillars in that tutorial. And I can sand these edges and then that will really define the two different layers. Hit all those edges and on this one we're gonna do the underside as well. So really soften those sharp corners to make it look a little bit more natural. And then now we just need to hot glue the two back together. Now we can draw in some brickwork. We're gonna work on the top here and just do a bit of a uh, field stone pattern, keeping it as random as we kind of possibly can. Once we have this pattern on the top, gonna to carry these lines down the sides. On the bottom row, we're just gonna put some random vertical lines separate from where the broken up from where the ones on the top course are. And once you're satisfied with all those spots, you can just go through and indent them a little bit further. And last, to complete the stone look, we're gonna take our tin foil and just roll it over top. Really dent this thing up. Now, we can take our timbers and put them in place here. If this were a really tight fit, I would probably use PVA, but because it's a bit loose, I'm just actually gonna fill this with some hot glue, drop the timbers in place. The toothpick actually pierces the foam underneath to really hold it and make sure you have it nice and straight. And now you can just leave everything to dry. All right, so now our little lamp post here has been drying for about half an hour, which is, you know, long enough to be able to pull these pins out. When you are pinning styrofoam that has been PVA glued, it is a good idea to try to pull the pins out before this uh, glue has completely dried. Like don't leave it overnight if possible, because sometimes the pins actually end up glued inside and when you pull them out, it rips a chunk of styrofoam. So if you can pull them out at that magic moment when things are dried enough that they're not gonna move, but they're not dried to the point where the pin is glued in place, that's great. Before I wanna proceed, the next thing I wanna do is kinda hide this gap uh, around where the post meets the bricks. There's a couple ways you could do this. One of my first thoughts was to cut some small bricks and just make basically like a little border around it with some 3D bricks. But then I decided I actually wanted it to look a little bit more rough. I figured I'll just do a little bit of sand so it looks like a little bit of rubble from the stone. I'm gonna take a bit of PVA glue Oop, when I say a bit, apparently I mean a whole lot. And I'm gonna do a couple little dabs in a few places on the, uh, on the cobblestone as well. 
I'm gonna brush off the excess that made it onto the timber because I don't really want it there. So now I'm gonna take a little bit of sand and I'm going to just drop it on the surface. I'm not, I don't wanna overdo this here. Now we can just do this. Tap off the excess. We'll have to wait for this to dry. So as you can see here, I gave the thing a coat in Mod Podge. Now, when I use Mod Podge, I use the matte stuff in the tub and I mix in black paint right into it. This way, when I'm coating things, uh, one, it shows me exactly where I've missed, but also then it speeds up my base coat of black. Coated this whole thing in Mod Podge. It's fairly stiff now, safe for the table. But one thing I have been starting to care more about lately on my builds is the undersides of them. Now, this is something that really doesn't matter too much. You could just leave things as is. But you know, there are those situations where for whatever reason, somebody knocks something over on the table. And I mean, a player character knocks something over, not an accident. And you gotta tip it over for it to make sense and you got this ugly underside showing. Also, it's always a vulnerable point. So I like to do something to these bottoms to make them look a bit nicer and be a little bit stiffer. So I'm actually gonna coat this thing with the same compound I used in the how to repair damaged terrain video. It's just drywall joint compound black paint and some white glue, and it will fill in the seam here from where we cut out for that washer. Again, this is a step you could definitely skip if you wanted. I've got tons of terrain with ugly bottoms because I've skipped it in the past. So I'm just putting it on with my finger. Now I'm gonna take some water and use the water just to smooth this over. There's also a small hole in each end here from where we ran that toothpick through. So I might as well take some of this and fill in those little holes. As is often the case while building terrain, we must wait for this to dry. At this point, the piece is ready for paint. And since the black Mod Podge mix had a really nice coverage on this, I don't need to put another coat of black on it. I can go right into color. I'm gonna base out the timbers with an espresso and the stonework with a dark gray. So starting with this espresso wet brush, I just wanna do full coverage on all these timbers. And the trickiest part is getting into this little triangle that we've created with the, with the framing. So just trying to evenly coat the entire thing, getting right into the wood grain grooves because when we do a black wash later, it'll bring those back out. I'm realizing that this piece is so small that the paint I just put on won't be dry quick enough for me to then hold it and paint the bottom. I'm gonna take a cork, some sticky tack, and I'm gonna give myself a handle. So now that I have a handle, I can paint the gray stonework. And again here, I'm gonna go for full coverage. Not minding if the gray paint gets into all those crevices because between the dry brushing and the washes, all those grooves will, will show up again. Now here, there's some excess brown uh, that I overbrushed that's still wet and I'm actually perfectly okay with it kind of blending and mixing in with the gray here. It's actually just going to give a little bit of variance and not look bad at all. Now one thing about these cheap acrylic craft paints, as you know, the coverage is not great so sometimes you have to rebrush things a few times to try to get rid of all the brush strokes and 
black showing through. And that's that. Now we just gotta let this dry a little bit before moving on to the next step. So I wanna highlight all the wood grain here. And my favorite color to do that with is this Craftsmart Fawn. It's kind of a golden brown. Gives the wood more of a kind of pine look to it. Getting pretty much all the paint off my brush and gonna go across the grain hitting those those ridges from the wire brush and you can see that this you know kind of golden brown uh, when put on top of the espresso kind of comes out looking a little bit a little bit gray and weathered which is what you want now I'm not gonna bother trying to get into this little triangle here with this color because nobody's gonna be able to see that anyway. And you just gotta make sure that you don't overdo it here and put too much on and make it look, you know, kind of globby. Hey, that is good for that. Now we can move on to the stone and I'm just gonna use this, which is gray. You can go with several different layers of paint slowly building up from the first, but I'm just doing this the really simple way of just dark gray, gray, and then we'll follow this up with a kind of off white. Lightly going across with very little paint on the brush. I tend to only load the brush couple times on a piece this size and here if you get some on the wood it doesn't really matter okay that is good so now we can hit all the edges with this off-white I use uh, it's called vanilla I like it better than the pure bright white it looks a little bit less extreme. So here we're gonna take off pretty much all the white. And as you may have noticed, I haven't cleaned my brush in between any of these colors uh, because having that little bit of color mixed in actually helps to blend things. So here, going over, doing a lot less than the last coat. I just want this to hit the highest points. Very simple paint. And you can actually take this and use it to kind of hit some of the edges, just these very outside edges of the wood. That'll make them stand out more. Now again, let's let this dry before we put on the black wash. So here I have my simple black wash that I made in a previous episode. You can check out that one if you want to see how to make it. This is a small enough piece that if you have good quality washes like the Games Workshop Newland Oil or whatever, you could get away with using it because it won't waste too much. Uh, but you can definitely get away with using this cheap black terrain wash. So here, basically just going to coat the entire thing. I try not to use a brushing motion so you don't end up activating any of the first uh, layers of paint and smudging. I prefer to just dab it on. Sometimes I will use a spray bottle uh, to squirt it on, but this piece is so small, it's not really worth it. Covering everything, not being afraid to put on too much because pretty much all of this will run off the piece. Uh, we just wait for this to dry. It'll take a little while. When the wash is dried, that is when you want to go ahead and seal your piece with the Minwax polyurethane. If you haven't already watched the video on sealing styrofoam that I made, check it out. Uh, I like to do it at this point because this styrofoam part is essentially done. Now we just need to move on to the lantern and I would prefer to have this all sealed up before you have the loose dangling kind of bits going on there. So this is done for now. 
it's been sprayed and we're gonna put that aside for a little bit and move on to making the lantern. So to make the lantern, you need to find some kind of a bead that has the right shape. I got these ones in one of those uh, big assorted packs of different plastic beads from Michaels. And it was one of maybe, I don't know, 30 or some odd uh, different beads that came with it. And there was a handful of these ones which have a kind of perfect shape for a lantern. Uh, the little dots on there are not ideal, but I mean, they can be just on there as decoration and it's fine. If you can find some sort of a bead that has the right shape, you're gonna be set. Otherwise you might need to actually kind of carve something, but if you can find something pre-made, that's ideal. Uh, these come with this kind of silver paint on them and they do not hold acrylic paint whatsoever. So I took one of them and I spray painted it uh, flat white already. And that's gonna give me a better base to work with. So when you're painting this, you wanna do the kind of glowing uh, candle light first and then the metal work last. So I'm gonna start with a, this is a, called Light Orange by Craftsmart. It's a nice kind of yellowy orange that works really well for flames. And I'm gonna go ahead and paint all of the individual panels with this. And I don't really care if I overpaint onto the lines that will eventually be painted in a metallic because it's all going to get covered later. And that's how it looks on the first pass of orange paint. You want to move on to the yellow before the orange has totally dried because you want to be able to blend the two colors so it has a more kind of realistic uh, glow to it. So I'm going to take some yellow. This is just a bright yellow and I'm just going to streak it across the center uh, of each of these panels, basically kind of a stripe, but it's gonna mix with the orange that's still pretty wet. And that's gonna give it a bit more of a kind of glowing effect. Now for the metal lantern frame, I'm just gonna use this folk art uh, metallic the color is gunmetal gray, and it's a nice kind of dark silver. I like it for things where you want a bit of a kind of cast iron or wrought iron look. You could also do this in like a bronze or a brass if you want to have that sort of a aesthetic on it. So here I'm just going to take the gunmetal and I'm going to highlight, uh, paint out all of these ridges uh, to kind of give some definition between the frame and the and the actual like, I guess, glass where the candlelight is coming through. Once the lantern bead is done being painted, you need to create some kind of a little hook on the lamp post to hold it, as well as a little loop of something on the actual lantern uh, for it to hook onto. So I, at one point, went to Michael's and purchased myself an assortment of different little metal uh, ringlets and hooks and loops and that sort of thing from the uh, jewelry making section. So that's what I'm using here. Now, unfortunately, I don't remember what any of these are specifically called. So you're gonna have to do a little bit of hunting on your own. I am going to be using one of these small gauge metal hoops and these little pins with an eyelet on it. So first is the hoop for the actual post. So this here is basically good to go, except I need to open this up a little bit more to allow another hook piece of metal to hook through it there. So I'm just gonna take a pair of needle nose pliers and open up this loop here a little bit more. So you wanna get it looking something like that. We need to attach this onto this post and I don't want it to be hanging down that far. 
and obviously I don't want it to be poking up through the top. Uh, so we need to cut this down. So just kind of eyeball a size that looks like it's about right. This is pretty fiddly little work, so it's kind of hard to show on camera. Then I need to make a hole for this to go into. And now I think this is actually getting in the way, so I'm gonna get rid of that there. So I'm just gonna take a pin right in the middle and I'm gonna poke through. I'm gonna go almost all the way through, but not quite. In order to glue this in place, I'm just gonna use a really small dab of Allian's Tacky Glue. Don't brain fart and get the idea to use super glue here, because remember, super glue melt, melts styrofoam and the inside of your piece is not sealed uh, in this hole, so you don't want it eating its way into it. So I'm just gonna take this and I'm going to coat the stem of this metal hook here. It's a nice glob of glue. Don't be afraid to put a decent amount because this will dry clear. And then just feed that into the hole there and place it how you want it. This glob of extra glue here, you can kind of wipe some of it away so you don't have a giant mound. And that is ready to go. And you can let this dry. Now for the part that actually goes into the lantern, uh, the bead has a small hole at the top here. So what I wanna do is take this circle and bend it into a very narrow uh, U shape essentially. I'm just gonna use my needle nose and try to squish it. Pull these out here. It's a little bit tr tricky to do. You're essentially looking to make something like that. Now you just gotta see if it will fit into this hole on top. Again, I'm just gonna take a bunch of this tacky glue on the ends and feed this through. You want the lantern to look something like that and the hook to look something like that. And you just gotta leave these two pieces to dry. All right guys, that is how you build a cool looking lantern for your D&D game. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, hit that like button, hit subscribe and drop me a comment below. Again, check out my new website, blackmagiccraft.ca and take a look at the web store. There you can buy all the tools I used during this build and of course, if you find my videos useful and you wanna help me help you, the best way you can do that is by supporting Black Magic Craft on Patreon. All of the funds that you guys donate via Patreon get rolled back into this channel and allow me to upgrade equipment, dedicate more time, and buy more cool materials and supplies to test out for you. Click that link, link is also in the description, and until next time guys, peace.